Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. From Mamma Mia, you're listening to No Filter, and I'm Mia Friedman. It was 2016, and Emily Hall was preparing for the happiest moment of her life. In just three weeks, heavily pregnant Emily and her husband Matt were going to meet their baby. Emily and Matt were in high school when they got together, and they just never grew apart. Ten years later, they were married. Matt was a pilot, Emily had started a fashion business with a friend, and it was by every measure an ordinary day, until there was a knock on the door. I opened the door and there was two police, a policeman and a policewoman standing there, and I said, what's wrong? I said, what's happened? What were you thinking? I thought that they were going to tell me he had an accident and they'd taken him to hospital. Like, you don't think that something like that's going to happen. Emily's life was divided in two by that knock. The life she had with Matt before and the life she had afterwards without him. At just 29, Matt had died unexpectedly. But I'm not going to tell you that part of Emily's story. I'll let her do that in her own words. Becoming a widow at such a young age, Emily was just 30. It's not anything that you can prepare for. And the word widow is not one you even associate with young women or pregnant women or women in the prime of their lives. And yet it happens, and not just to Emily. Since that day, Emily has assembled a community for young widows who, as she says, don't want the death of their partner to be the end of their story. And for Emily, it really wasn't. Because what eventually happened after that knock on the door was a wonderful life of love and of happiness. Emily's story is tender and beautiful, and you're going to love her. On No Filter this week, here's Emily Hall. Emily, when you know you're doing a podcast interview like this, you obviously know what we're going to talk about. Yes. Do you wake up this morning feeling a bit sick, a bit anxious? Does it take you back to bad days? I actually woke up feeling okay, which I thought was a bit strange. It wasn't until I was walking into the office that I started getting a bit nervous. I think I've kind of put this in a box a little bit. So sometimes I put it away and then I think about the things I'm going to have to talk about. But that's okay. I think I've talked about it enough over the last almost seven years that I'm starting to be okay with it. I've got a friend who lost someone close to her in her family and she talked about it as like you put your grief in your pocket Mm -hmm. and sometimes you take it out but what can be really hard is when someone else comes and rummages in there. Mm. Do you find that, that you sort of have to be prepared to talk about Matt? Yeah, I felt like earlier, like years ago, it would almost take me a week or two to recover from but now I'm I'm pretty good. Like it might take me an hour or two to kind of get myself together and then I'm okay. But, yeah, it's taken a long time to get here. It's super hard as an interviewer to know how to approach it because I've listened to a lot of interviews you've done, interviews with other people who've experienced trauma or loss, mm-hmm. particularly sudden trauma or loss. And what they'll say is take me back to the day and they'll want you to step them through it And Grace Tame helped me understand what that's like from the other side of the microphone where it's like, so tell me about your deepest trauma. Mm. Can you just tell me that? (laughs) Have you found that you've needed to put some boundaries around it because your trauma is not other people's entertainment but it's also your story? It is. I've felt like talking about it has helped me heal. So... There's nothing really that's like out of bounds. I feel like it does help me to talk about it. But as I said, it's taken me a long time to get here. And I should just say I know how many other women this is going to help and how many other women have already been helped by you talking about it. But I want to go back to meeting Matt. You're a teenager. You're in high school. (laughs) How did you meet? Through my best friend, actually. She, um, they were good friends. (laughs) 
I dated his best friend for a little bit before. <laughs> That's in high school. It's a very small dating yeah, pool you have yeah. to draw from. But he was always a lot more mature for a 16-year-old. Boys play games, but he wasn't a boy. He was always a lot more grown up. Is it true that he said, I love you on your first date? Yeah, he did. How old was he? 16. That's wild for a 16-year-old boy to yeah. go there. Yeah. What did you think? Oh, I'm a lover. So I, I said, I love you back. Yeah. That's a lot. Yeah. No one was playing hard to get. It's <laughs> no, clear. Yes. How did things progress from there? Quickly, I see. Yeah, we were just inseparable. You know, young people, they break up and get back together. We never did that. What happened after school? Because that's the kind of time that, you know, people will go, you know, it's been great, but now the whole wide world's open to me. Yeah. I always talked about our relationship, like we grew together. A lot of teenagers or young people, they grow apart, but we grew together. He was a pilot, so he moved to Longreach and Townsville and Cairns. So he would have had to do a lot of training and travelling. Did you go with him? So not for the first few years and then I was just sick of it. So I moved to Townsville with him. So you had a long-distance relationship for all that time? For a few years, yeah. That's hectic. Yeah. And all your friends, I imagine, were partying and dating and doing all the things that you do when you're a teenager. Yeah, so that was hard. So I had obviously never moved out of home, so I decided I'm going to move to Townsville with you. And then a few weeks later, he got a job offer in Darwin and I had just started a job at a travel agency. So I felt like I couldn't leave. So I stayed in Townsville for six months on my own. What did you want to do with your career? I went to TAFE when I was young, when I first left school to study fashion, but I wanted to do shoe design. But being an 18 year old, I couldn't figure out how to get into it. So I kind of just did some retail jobs and then when I moved to Townsville and then Darwin, I was like, let's just do travel because that'll, I'll be able to move around. When did you get married? 2013. And how old were you both? 25, I think, 6, 26. When you've been with someone for that long, because you'd mm. already been together 10 years by yeah, then. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Did either of you ever go through that? I wonder what else is out there. Like, I really love you, but maybe we just met a bit early when we were still kids. No. Never. Never. He was like my best mate. So like going on holidays with him and like we had so much fun together. So it didn't feel like that, no. It's interesting because when you met, you were a girl. And when you lost Matt, you were a woman. That's a big road to travel with someone and not grow apart. Mm. How did you not grow apart? Because there are people who get married when they're both adults and grow apart quite quickly. Like how did you consciously not or was it just something that? It was just natural. Like we didn't really have to work. I know that sounds bad, but we didn't really have to work that hard at making it work because we were just, it just just clicked. You were 37 weeks pregnant. It was a really hot day. Matt had just come back from LA and he wanted to go out dirt bike riding. Yeah. He kind of just started doing it. So Was it dangerous? Yeah, it can be. But I think he probably that day went on a track he probably shouldn't have. He was meant to come back about 3.30. Mm-hmm. He wasn't home. What did you do? I was like I texted him and I called him and nothing and then I messaged my girlfriend who her husband was with him and I didn't hear from her either. And I was like, oh, I don't know. He should be home soon. And then I had a knock at the door and my dogs were barking. I opened the door and there was two police, a policeman and a policewoman standing there. And I said, what's wrong? I said, what's happened? But the dogs were barking and they're like, Mm -hmm. can you please put the dogs out? So I went and put them out and I came back to the door. I let them in. What were you thinking? I thought that they were going to tell me he had an accident and they'd taken him to hospital. Like you don't think that something like that's going to happen. And they said, is your husband Mark Hall? I suddenly had this relief, like, oh, they've got the wrong house. And then they looked at each other and then they said, did he go dirt bike riding today? (sighs) And I was like, yes. And they started saying too much, like he overheated and he got heat stroke and 
he passed away. I was like, sorry, what? And then I started pacing. I was like, no. I was like, we're about to have a baby. Like, this can't be happening. And, you know, like, I don't know if you're like this, but I'm a fixer. So I'm like, when something goes wrong, I'm going to fix it. Mm. This is something you can't fix. Like, no matter, like, how much praying or what you do, there's nothing that's, like, it's just completely out of your control. And, like, the permanence of it. Like, it oh. can't be undone. Oh. Or reversed. I was kind of like, well, do I go to the hospital? Like, then I was like, okay, now what do I do? I called my parents and they came over and then I had to call my father-in-law and tell him and the screaming down the end of the phone, I can't tell you, like, it's something I'm never going to forget. Then we all ended up driving to the hospital and because it was... Did the police stay with you? They just kind of just stood there, like, watching us. I was just like, can you please go now? So then... We had my parents, my brother and sister-in-law, so Matt's brother and Matt's parents. We drove to Nambour, which was about an hour and a half away from Brisbane. And I just remember looking out the window and there was the biggest harvest moon I've ever seen. Like, like I can't even explain how big this moon was. And I just thought I was in some sort of, like, nightmare. Like, you know when people say, like, your heart's broken, like literally it feels like your heart hurts. You just think that they're going to turn up at the door or, you know. So we ended up driving there, but because it was a Friday afternoon and the coroner was finished for the weekend, we couldn't see him. They wouldn't let us see him because the body was now their, like, property. So for me, I'm like, I'm just about to have this man's baby and you're not letting me see my husband. And I've driven an hour and a half. Yep. I just. That's insane. I've never heard of that before. Mm. Is that because they needed to establish how he died? And I mean, it... maybe, maybe. What did you do? We ended up just driving back to Brisbane. And I just <gasps> like. Were they sympathetic at the hospital and say. I like... mean, yeah, but also like, sorry, there's nothing we can do. It's like still blows my mind. Did you want to just like scream and throw yourself on the floor? I'm pretty sure I did. <laughs> yeah. I think they had to put me in a wheelchair at one stage. I just like the stress that obviously it put me under and my body. Honestly, those two weeks, I don't know how I got through them. My husband left to go out dirt bike riding mm. and now I've like slipped through some weird hole in the universe where – he died mm. of this thing that I didn't even know could kill you, which is being too hot. I know. It's shocking. But I, then I started hearing stories about other people who had died from heat stroke. I'm like, ugh. It's not something that people know, is it? It's unbelievable. Like you think you might get hit by a car, you could fall off your bike, you could injure yourself, get a head injury, but overheating is just not something people I mean, maybe professional athletes who run marathons might think about it. It ended up coming out in the report that he had a blockage in one of his arteries. So that's how I justified it, that I believe if he didn't have that blockage, he wouldn't have died from the heat stroke. And for a 29-year-old to have a blockage that bad, it doesn't happen. Tell me if I'm getting this right. Knowing that made it a little bit better because it wasn't like if he hadn't have gone for that bike ride, there was nothing he could have done. Like it was going to happen. It just yeah, happened to happen like then. Yeah, it's almost like I justify it by saying, imagine if he was driving down the street with our child in the back seat. Or and he flying had a, a plane. Or flying a plane and something happened, you know. But then I hear about people who do find out that they have these blockages and I'm like, why couldn't he have had mm. another chance? You had a baby to deliver. Those two weeks you say were a blur. Mm -hmm. What did the people around you do? I don't think I could have got through what I've been through without the people around me. Like my parents and my friends and my sister-in-law and like even my brother-in-law like and my in-laws who had just lost their son, you know. I feel for other women who don't have that sort of support because, yeah, I wouldn't have been able to get through that without them. What did they do for you? Just like sitting with me or making me meals or helping me clean my house. Like just 
it doesn't take much, but just being there, it was massive. One of Matt's really good mates and his wife would come over for dinner like once or twice a week and just have dinner with me because it's when you're alone that it's that's when it hits you. People would imagine that those couple of weeks, the time after you lose someone suddenly, you'd just be crying, crying, crying 24-7, but it's not like that, is it? What might surprise people about those weeks after you lose someone if they haven't experienced it before? I mean, it definitely is like a roller coaster. Like we had a celebration for him, which, you know, it wasn't a funeral, it was just a celebration, but 750 people turned up for him. So, like, it's very bittersweet to have all the people that you love and everyone that loved him there, but he wasn't there. You know, people that come and just like tell you stories about him and. Was there laughter? Yeah. Yeah, there was. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously there was a lot of joy as well because Harry came along, so. Was there a lot to do? I'm pretty lucky that most people had just taken over for me, like the funeral plans and all of that. Like I didn't really have to do anything. Like my brother-in-law took over like all my finances to deal with that because even like things you don't think about, like one of our main bank account was in just in his name. It wasn't in both of our names. So they seize all your bank accounts and things like that. So you have to move your money quickly before they take it. Who's they? Uh, I don't know. The people. The people. <laughs> the people in charge of such things. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of, I once heard someone say, there's a lot of admin after a death. Oh, yes. Yes. Just even like weird things like having to call Qantas and say, I'm going to have to cancel my Europe trip because my husband's just died. And the people on the other end of the phone are like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm not trying to make people feel awkward, but like just things like that you. Just like really menial things like his mobile phone. Uh, It's still sitting in my bedside table. (laughs) Between his brother and I, I think we've paid for it for about five years. I think we've only just cancelled it. Every little thing like that, Mm. does it feel like a little death? It does. The clothes he took off the night before were sitting in our bathroom for like a good six months, just on the floor, sitting there. Mm. Even things that like he bought for the kitchen, like a mug that he bought, for example, and it broke. You like have a mental breakdown because you're like, that was Matt's mug. You know, just things that you don't realise. There's a lot to do in the weeks before having a baby as well. You had a C-section, was it planned? It was planned, yeah. I had a... He was breached. So you were always going to have to have a C-section. Yeah. yeah. How did you feel leading up to that day, which was going to be the happiest day? I just was like, I desperately want this baby. I need this baby. Yeah. I just wanted it. I just wanted him to come. So I was looking forward to it. Who was there with you when he was born? My mum and my mother-in-law. I think usually you can only take one person in with you, but they let us have both of them. That was a very incredible gift that you gave your mother-in-law to have her there. Yeah, that was important for me, yeah. Did you feel Matt in the room? Yeah, we had had a little frame with a photo. I know that sounds crazy. Doesn't sound crazy at all. Did you feel him there? It's never really enough. Yeah. Yeah. I remember interviewing someone who lost their husband when they were pregnant Mm. and she said it only became real to her. It was early in her pregnancy. She was only about 15 weeks maybe. And she said she always believed in that magical thinking way that her husband would walk in after she had the baby. It was actually their third baby. And she said when he didn't, that's when it became real for her because she was like, he wouldn't have missed this. Absolutely. You had to go home with the baby. Mm -hmm. Who was there to help you? I went and moved in with mum and dad for I think five weeks. That's good because it takes a village. And you were recovering from major surgery and you were deep in grief. Yeah. Could you feel the joy and the grief at the same time? Absolutely, yeah. The first night I got home, I had this out-of-body experience. I think it was, at the time I didn't understand what it was, but I think it was just high stress, no sleep. Something was going on in my head and I said, all I could say was, 
you need to call an ambulance. I couldn't get any other words out. Like it just would be too much. It's a lot. Yeah. People talk about after having a baby that feeling of it's just so overwhelming and you were all, already had that mm. with the volume turned up to 11 and then you put another volume of 11 on top of it. It's too much. It's a lot. <laughs> In the next part of our conversation, I asked Emily what the response was when she took a huge step into a new life. Harry grew up. Matt wasn't there. Mm -hmm. When was the first time you heard the word widow? I desperately was looking for someone who understood what I was going through. So I was like on Facebook trying to find widows groups. Like I found this one, it was just like these older American women and they were all just whinging. I decided quite early on that I wasn't going to feel sorry for myself Mm. because, yes, this really terrible thing's happened to us, but I'm 30 years old. I had just turned 30. I wasn't going to let it be the end of my story. So I started grieving on my Instagram. Just it was almost like a diary entry for myself. And like, it's funny, I go back and read some of the stuff that I wrote and it's like, oh, what a positive girl I was. It was, yeah, giving myself a pep talk. What kind of things did you write? Just that I was going to be okay and, Mm. you know, it's not the end of my story. And Mm. I know some of it sounds a bit cliche, but I wasn't, I wasn't ready to give up. This is such a basic question, but what about money? You've got a business. Mm-hmm. You've got Elsa Pato. Am I pronouncing it right? Yes. You yeah. know I've got your shoes. I know. <laughs> I bloody love your shoes. Yeah, I only, it's only when, when I was like researching that I'm like, no way. Yes. I'm mad for your shoes. Yeah. So life is difficult though in the fashion industry mm-hmm. and you were running a small business. Mm-hmm. Were you already running it when Matt died? Yes. He was a pilot. He was obviously bringing in a decent income. Mm-hmm. What happened? Like, what do you do? My best friend did a GoFundMe page, which was very, very kind, and all the amazing people who donated. I still feel terrible that I haven't, like, personally thanked every single one of them because it was incredible. I did get a bit of backlash from that afterwards, though. What? On his six-month anniversary, I was like, I'm going to go to Hawaii for five days. Mm. And I had people saying stuff as well that I shouldn't be spending the money on holidays. What should you spend it on? A stick to hit yourself with? Yeah, exactly. For me, if I was donating to someone, I'd be like, good on her, you know? Yeah. Good on her for doing that. Go buy yourself a frock, do whatever it takes to to make yourself feel better. There was also the side of the media being very interested in your story. Why do you think that was? Because you were young and pretty, an objectively interesting story. I think so. When a young person dies suddenly. A newspaper in Brisbane took it too far a couple of times. They always, you know, say that they want to talk about my business, for example, and then <sighs> turn it around to make it about Matt. Or the day I was rolled out of surgery with Harry and someone had leaked that I was having the baby by C-section. It was in the newspaper that morning when I got out of surgery. To not be able to grieve in private. Yeah, it was a lot. How did you maintain your business while you were going through grief? You know, there's no maternity leave when you're running your own business. You've just had a new baby. Mm -hmm. You've lost your husband. How the hell do you keep that going? (laughs) My business partner, Letitia, she really took over for the first year or so. Shout out to (laughs) Letitia. We have done that for each other. When she went and had a baby, I did the same for her. So, um, Were you worried about money for the future. Absolutely. It's one of those things people don't think about. I decided that I had to go back to work at five or six months, which didn't work out really. (laughs) You know, I had done a few jobs afterwards that nothing really, you know, an extra job on top of the business just to get to have some money coming in. Running your own business, there's a lot of costs involved too. Absolutely. Particularly in fashion, you've got to manufacture things, you've got to pay for things before you sell them. Absolutely. We're lucky we just do everything in small quantities so we don't have to buy lots of stock, which is a good thing, which is why we're still a small business because, Mm. you know. It's that scaling up that can be really hard because it needs so much investment. Mm. When did people start saying to you, you'll find love again? The whole, uh, you're still young, you'll find love again. Oh, thank you so much. What do you mean to say to that? It's almost like they're saying, oh, you'll be right, you'll find happiness again. 
I know they mean well, but just don't say it. Is it like, here's a silver lining on the cloud, you're young, whatever, and you're like, no, it's about the cloud. Yeah, exactly. I'm living inside the dark cloud. Absolutely. My father-in-law actually said to me quite early on, which he said to me, Emily, we want you to meet someone else. We don't want you to feel like you have to be like this, be on your own forever, which really meant a lot to me because it was really important for me. Like Harry was so young and obviously I did think about, you know, maybe one day having more children. That makes me want to cry because that's such giving you permission like that, not that you yeah. needed permission, but I, I it imagine me, it you meant kind a of lot. did. Yeah. And Harry was an IVF baby too, so I did have some, like I still do, have some embryos in the freezer. I did put one in 10 months after having Harry, but it didn't work out. That's a big decision. So then that was a, yeah, I learned a lot about myself in that. What did you learn? I just thought like, yes, I could have another baby on my own, but do I want to? What Do I want to do mm. that? Do people sort of want you to be sad all the time or did they want you to be sad all the time or did you feel pressure to not seem happy because you are a widow? I think it's more like pressure to post about grief, for example. Like mm. there's more to me than just that. And I don't want people to think that I'm the widow. So the reason that we, I feel like now I need to justify why, why I'm talking to you about it, <laughs> the reason that we wanted to do this Young Widows of Instagram story, cover story for Mamma Mia and why I wanted to talk to you was about that, about, you know, I've interviewed Elodie Pullen mm. who lost her partner and went on to have a baby afterwards via IVF from his sperm. But the idea that being a widow can look like a lot of different things and doesn't have to be the end of the chapter. Absolutely, yeah. And I assume that's why you've agreed to do this and talk about it because it's like for all the women, like this friend of mine who's just lost her husband who thinks, well, my life is over now. And it's like she's not ready to be told you'll find love again, mm. but it's more like time transporting into her future to go, oh, wow, all of these women have walked in my shoes and they're smiling and they're happy mm. and they've moved on is an awful way of putting it, but mm. they've had new chapters. Yes. Yeah, I remember early days when I would have a photo, for example, and I would smile, but I didn't mean it. And I, I always used to think, Am I ever going to smile and actually feel happy and mean it? Yeah. And like it does take time. You can't rush the grief. Like yeah. you have to sometimes just sit in it and just cry and just feel sorry for yourself. But then you need to pick yourself up and move on because, yeah, feeling sorry for yourself isn't going to help anyone. Matt and I just had our 10-year wedding anniversary and my Ooh. girlfriends took me out. And I've had some people say, oh, so is that going to be the last year that you celebrate your wedding anniversary? Yeah, I'm finished now. Like someone close to me and I was like, um, I guess, maybe, maybe not. Like we don't have to do it every year, but I felt like 10 years was a a big milestone. Yeah. Did you acknowledge it at home? Uh, or it's like a part of your grief you keep? I don't expect much. Like I've said to Dave, I don't want you to make a big fuss, just a cuddle. Mm. and say, I hope you're okay today. That's all I need. I don't like to make a big deal about it. I had a really terrible idea for the shot for the cover, which was just so insensitive now that I think about it. And so I owe you an apology for that, which <laughs> is you holding a photo of you and Matt. Yeah. And I was like, I had in my mind, that would be such a great cover because it's about the young widows of Instagram. But like you said no, and I'm so glad you did because I was like, oh, she said no. And then I was like, of course she bloody said no. Can you explain that? It's just I was like, that's not going to make Dave feel good. Exactly. And again, the whole I don't want to be the widow. Yeah. And really it's awful because, like, you don't want to be disrespectful to Matt and his family, but that would have been really disrespectful to Dave that he's in this new chapter and this new chapter is about the four of you. Matthew Riley, the author who lost his wife and has now, I believe, remarried or repartnered, he talks about celebrating those days, like birthdays, when he comes to Australia visiting the grave of his first wife. And I asked him, you know, does your new partner have any? And he goes, no, no, that's just my thing. That's yeah. just my thing with her. Like my relationship with her 
continues, even though she's passed away, it continues on another track. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, we kind of know that it's just what I do now and, like, I feel bad because there's always something. There's a birthday. There's a wedding anniversary. There's so many dates, aren't there? Oh, there's so many dates. The birthday, the day he passed, at wedding anniversaries, the day you met. like Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I want to ask you just finally about the connection that you've made to other women and how does it feel like a burden because a lot of other women have got stories and they reach out to you, I imagine. How do you manage that without getting constantly catapulted back to your dark days? So I still have people that reach out to me on my Instagram just saying, you know, thank you so much for sharing your story. You know, I'm going through this or I'm going through that or I've just lost my husband And it does feel good that I've done this for a reason, that I'm helping these women just to know that there is hope for them. Yeah. There were so many girls that, you know, I've met through Instagram or Facebook or wherever, or people have introduced me. So I said, why don't I start this group, just a Facebook group that people can post whatever they want on there. The group that you were looking for but couldn't find. Yes, exactly. I was desperately looking to find. So we've all kind of just, there's like almost 150 girls now, which is. Wow. But we all just find each other. It's quite amazing. from all over the world? It's mainly Australia, but there's a few from overseas. And young women. Yeah. Yeah. How young do you have to be to join the group? Asking for a friend. Oh. Literally asking for a friend. Yeah, yeah. There's no age. Like, okay. you know, and it obviously doesn't have to be just someone who's lost their husband. It can be their partner or their, you know. You don't ask so, to see copies of wedding certificates. No, no, no. No formal no, documentation no, no. required to join the group. But, yeah, I, the first widows group that we had, there was like maybe 10 girls and a lot of them had children. It was quite heavy. Like it took me a good like week or so to get past it. Like I just, it did feel really heavy. So it felt heavy when you met up. Yeah. Just because there was like, you know, one of the girls who I'm really close with now, she literally came with her like three month old baby and her husband had just passed like eight weeks ago. Like, Uh. you know, just thinking about those early days and that I never want to be back there ever in my life. So how do you navigate that with that group? Because I imagine you've always got people coming in fresh. Yes. And coming in hot in the depths of their grief. Yes. How do you navigate that? Because I imagine it's not all you want to talk about. No. Like you don't just want to go, a bit like a book club. Like we had another young girl who was, you know, her first widow's group, I think it was only a few, four or five weeks. Yeah. So like it is really heartbreaking to see them like that. But just, you know, yeah. we've said to her, please reach out, you know, if you ever need anything, if you need someone to speak to. Mm. like, And I, I truly mean that because I wish I had that when I was, yeah. 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 When did you start feeling ready to date? In hindsight, I met my now partner after a year and a half, which in hindsight was too early. Was it? You know, I was obviously very lonely and desperate to feel like, everyone else, to feel part of a family. I think that part for me was the hardest, not feeling like I belonged anywhere and like I was starting again. That whole starting again thing is really hard. But when I say that, I wasn't ready. Like we went through a lot. You and Dave? Yeah. When you make a dating profile (laughs) because you went on the apps, that's where you met Dave. (laughs) Yeah. Do you use the word widow? I imagine probably you don't in not, the dating not, profile. <laughs> not in the profile. <laughs> I think in my second photo I actually put a photo of my son, well, of Harry, yeah. because I was just like if people sees my photo with my son and decides that I'm not for them, then I'd rather them not even contact me. Because that's who you are. Yeah. He's part of the package. Yeah. Was it overwhelming and did you feel I always, disloyal? I always laughed when I was with Matt, because I was like, Haha, I'm never going to have to go on those dating apps. Do you know what? I didn't feel disloyal. I didn't because I knew what sort of man Matt was and I knew that he would want me to be happy. So you swiped and Dave swiped. Where'd you go on your first date? He took me to a bar on the river. He drove. Why is that significant that he drove? Because he wasn't planning to get smashed. Yeah, and he okay. was like responsible. Mm-hmm. Mm. Was he your age? Four years older than me. 
What's the first date like? It must have been bizarre. You know, usually in high school, you you know, friend of a friend or yeah. meet them at a party. Friend of your ex-boyfriend. Yeah, exactly. Often. Yeah. In the circle. Absolutely. Or um, ex-boyfriend of your friend. <laughs> oh, that's how it goes in high school. Uh, absolutely. But no, he was a gentleman. He was like driving me home at like six o'clock at night and I was like, I have a great bottle of wine at home. Should we go get it and go back to your house? <laughs> I love it. And then I spilt wine on his rug, so... So this is what you're in for. Yeah. It's good preparation <laughs> for life with a toddler. <laughs> the elephant in the room, obviously, on that first date was Matt. Did you talk about him? I had told him before our first date that what had happened, and I think he went a little bit like even the fact that I had a child is a lot. So, like, it was a lot for him to take on. I think he needed a bit of time to process it, but he was like, okay, I'm going to give this a go. Apparently there was something about me. So um, There is something about oh. you. There is. You've got a beautiful smile oh, and you've you. also got very kind eyes. Thank you. And We've I'm not even same. trying to pick you We've up. We've got the same eyes, Dave and I. Like, you do. Yeah, we do. You do. <laughs> it's amazing because when I was looking through Instagram, I saw you and Dave and I was like, you just look right. Hard launching a new partner when you're a widow, I imagine is a little more fraught than the usual hard launch. Mm. You just raised one eyebrow when I said that. How did you do it? Did you think about it? Were you nervous about it? Okay, well, this I need to tell you this backstory. So when he was driving me home from our first date, he said, oh, I went for this job on Thursday. I really hope I get it, blah, blah, blah. Then ended up saying the company name, and it's actually the company that Matt's family owns. Stop it. So I'm like, oh, shit, what am I going to do here? Oh, wow. But then I'm also like, as if that wasn't Matt sending him to me, you know? As if it wasn't. Yeah. So he ended up getting the job. So then I felt like I had to tell my in-laws after a month because I was like, what if he goes to the office and somehow they find out Yeah. that I'm dating already? Yeah. So... How'd you do that? Um, I just went and sat them down and had a glass of wine and told them it wasn't easy, but I did it. <laughs> and not only am I dating someone, but he works for you. Yeah. How did they react? They were actually okay, which was, yeah. Oh, like I was expecting them to be okay, only that's a hard conversation to have. They didn't fire Dave, put it that way. No. <laughs> <laughs> At what point does... Matt stop being the third person in the relationship or is it just always there? It's definitely been something that's hard to navigate for Dave. Sometimes he does. I shouldn't say it out loud, but I'm going to anyway. <laughs> like we've had to do couples counselling. It hasn't been an easy thing for us. How could it be an easy thing for you? Yeah, and he, he said in a counselling session once that he doesn't think I'm ever going to love him as much as I love Matt and for me that broke my heart like Matt and I were together for 13 years before he passed away so we were together for a long time almost half your life but also there is an extent where you put the person that you love that passes away on a pedestal Mm. because you know they could do no wrong really when that when someone passes away yeah they become this caricature of virtue yeah and is that what you would do even in your head? Like, Matt wouldn't do that. Yeah, like, you know, Dave and I would have an argument about something and I'd, like, get extra upset because I'm like, if Matt was here, this wouldn't be happening, you know? Like, yeah. it's stupid, but it happens. Like, Of course. Yeah. Is it a bit like, because you've got two children now, mm-hmm. you and Dave had little Oliver. Yeah. How old's Oliver now? He's two and a half. And how old's Harry? Six and a half. So you've now got two children and when you have one and you're pregnant with a second, you think, I will never be able to love a child as much as I love this first child. How possibly could I? And then you do. And then you have a third, you know, if you have a third child or a fourth child, it's weird. It's Mm. not a finite thing. Is it a bit like that with your two husbands, you know, with Dave and Matt? absolutely. Your heart grows. I know it sounds stupid. Your heart grows. It's not a cake. It's like a magic cake that never runs out. I can still love him and love Dave with everything that I've got. Being able to see Dave as a father and what he's done with Harry is just 
Like that to me is a man. He's a fantastic father. I went deep diving on Dave's Instagram. <laughs> he told me you liked a photo. <laughs> I'm not very subtle. <laughs> I would be a very bad stalker, it would seem. <laughs> I went way back and what struck me about him is his level of emotional intelligence, which is I think greater than any man I've ever known in terms of I went all the way back to because he'd been married before. Yes. And on the day that his divorce came through, he posted a photo of him and his ex-wife on their wedding day Mm. and he wrote the most beautiful post about this was one of the happiest days of my life and now it's also one of the saddest because our marriage is over. And what he wrote about her and about them was so beautiful Mm. And it wasn't that he wished that they weren't getting divorced, but it was more just being able to hold the joy and the sadness in the same place. Mm. And I thought that kind of tells you what you need to know about a man who then comes into the life of a widow because there is the joy and the sadness in the same place. And then some of the most moving posts on his Instagram are actually about Harry. How did that relationship develop. Harry was so little. He was only 18 months when Dave came into your life. Did you and Dave get quite serious quite quickly? Yeah. um, You only know how to do that. (laughs) You only have one speed. (laughs) I mean, I did introduce him quite early only because it felt right. They just became like best mates straight away. It was really sweet. Was there part of you that was like, oh, what if this doesn't work out? And then Harry's going to lose this man in his life. Do you know what? I'm not one of those people that worry about, I'm like future Emily's problem type thing. Like Mm. I don't, I try not to worry about things in the future because it's something I can deal with later. Since you lost Matt or have you always been like that? I feel like I've always been like that, but Mm. probably more so. I'm just live for the moment. (laughs) And when did Harry and you and Dave have to talk about what are you to Harry? I've read some of Dave's posts and he talks about I'm not a father but I'm a dad when he was talking about Harry. Mm. He was drawing that distinction that he's like, Matt's your father but I'm your dad. We always speak about Matt. Like he's got, you know, photos up on the wall and, you know, some of Matt's things up and we've just always said to him, he knows Matthew is his, I don't know why they call him Matthew, maybe it's his grandmother says that, Matthew is his dad that's in heaven. And then he has Dave. Who he also calls Dad. Well, he still calls him Dave, but we've said to him, you can call him whatever you want. You can call him Dave, you can call him Dad, whatever works for you. Mm. So he still calls him Dave, but he, when he refers to him to his friends, he says, my dad, which is very sweet. And Dave calls himself Harry's dad. Like he's like, I've got two sons. Yeah. Yeah. I imagine that line of wanting to be there for him but not wanting to overstep invisible boundaries or lines. Has that been a difficult road for you and Dave to navigate or has it just kind of happened? No, it's just flowed. He, you know, we'll still tell him off if he does something wrong. He doesn't feel like Ollie's his biological son and Harry's his stepson. Like it doesn't feel like that. It just feels like they're his boys, you know. And a lot of women repartner and their new partner is the stepfather Mm. to their child. Mm. I grew up in a blended family exactly like that and my brother always had like dad and then daddy Joe, which Mm. was his biological father who he didn't live with Mm. and saw sometimes. So kids are very able to kind of make that distinction. And I guess Harry doesn't have any sense of grief or loss about Matt because he never knew him and never had him in his life. Or does he feel sad? He went through a stage like maybe a year or so ago where he would get upset. He's like, I just want my dad back. And that was hard for me to navigate because I was like, you know, he's never met his dad. Mm. But he would cry and he would get upset. So... That's a tough thing to navigate. That suggests that you've done an amazing job of keeping Matt alive for him. Well, yeah, and that's important to me. It's it's always going to be his dad. I don't, I'm not one of those people that's just like going to pretend that it didn't happen because of course it happened. And 
you know, crap stuff happens to good people. But, yeah, I just want to be very open with my children. Does Harry ask a lot of questions? Has he asked a lot of questions at times? Where's my dad? How did he die? Where's heaven? Not as many as I thought that he would ask. They might still be coming, you know? Mm. Like he's still only six. I think we've done the best job that we can to try and explain to him like where he is, that he's in heaven. You know, it's hard. It's a hard thing, isn't it? It's a really hard thing. <laughs> I have several friends in my life who've been through this and, and I wanted to say thank you for what you do. There's an expression that out there is someone with a wound in the shape of your words and I think that at our finest what we do as women is share our vulnerabilities and our experiences even if it's really hard for us in order to make other women feel seen and heard and understood and I just know that so many women are so grateful for what you do and if people want to say thanks, how can they go and buy your shoes? Which are fabulous, by the way. <laughs> we'll put a link in the show notes, sure, definitely. Sounds good. But is that the best way to support you and to say thank you for that everything would be lovely. that you do? Yeah, that's lovely. Thank you. I really appreciated the fact that Emily was willing to talk about Matt and share the full story of his loss and the complexity of how losing someone she loved so much actually opened space in her life and in her heart. For one, Mr. Davy Downey, who's also the love of her life and by all accounts, a beautiful man, just like Matt was. I went deep on Davy when I was preparing for this interview. And not only does he have the kindest face and warmest eyes, the way he writes about Emily and how much he loves her and their boys shows a level of emotional intelligence and openness that's incredibly rare. They are just such a beautiful family. And we've actually done a Mamma Mia cover story called The Young Widows of Instagram about Emily and some of the other women that she's brought together. Women who've had that same experience of having their lives unexpectedly split into before and after. There's a link in the show notes. If you would like to support Emily, you can purchase from her fabulous business called El Zapato. I love her shoes. I've got a pair of her flats. I'm a huge fan. And we'll also put a link in the show notes. This episode was produced by Cassie Merritt and Emmeline Gazillis. The executive producer of No Filter is Eliza Ratliff with sound production by Madeline Juano. I'm Mia Friedman, and I'll be back in your ears next week. <laughs>